Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my mystery series or if you're new here, welcome. I upload a new unsolved true crime video every single Wednesday featuring unidentified people, unsolved cases and missing people. So if you want to stick around and learn about these cases, please make sure you click that subscribe button down below. Today I want to focus on what is actually a fairly well known case I'd say, but that doesn't make it any less important to talk about. This is the disappearance of 9 year old Antoinette Christine Caladito from Gallup, New Mexico, almost 37 years ago. It's always important to talk about the cases of missing children, of all missing people, but it feels even more important in Antoinette's case, because the authorities all seem to agree here that there's a chance Antoinette very much could still be alive. There's certainly reason at minimum to think that she wasn't killed immediately after she was abducted. If Antoinette is still alive, there's every chance she could still be found today. As I always say, it takes just that one person who knows maybe even the tiniest bit of information and we could have a whole case solved, even if it is 37 years old. Antoinette Cayadito was born on Christmas Day on December 25th, 1976 to Penny Cayadito and Anthony Montoya. Now some other sources say that her father was called Larry. I'm not sure if that's a nickname or if the name Anthony is just wrong. It seems like a kind of 50-50 split between all the sources I was looking at. I'll probably just refer to him as her father to save any confusion. Her mum, Penny, was Navajo, part of Navajo Nation, and her father was of Italian and Hispanic descent, making Antoinette biracial. At the time of her disappearance, she was just nine years old. She was four foot seven and 55 pounds. She had black hair, brown eyes, and a number of dark colored moles, including some very obvious ones on her right cheek and on her nose. She also had some more on the back of both hands and on her right knee. She had scars as well on her knees and one on her lip, and she had to wear glasses because her eyesight just wasn't great even at nine years old. She also had both of her ears pierced, so she had a lot of distinguishable features. At the time of her disappearance, she would have been wearing a knee-length pink nightgown and maybe a silver chain with a small cross-shaped turquoise pendant. Today, Antoinette would be 46 years old. Antoinette also had two younger sisters, Wendy and Sunida, known as Sadie, and after their parents separation, it seems like she took on somewhat of a parental role with her younger sisters. Maybe this is me projecting, me speaking as the oldest sibling, oldest daughter myself, but that does seem to be quite often the case. Antoinette assumed quite a lot of the responsibilities of caring for her younger sisters, with Wendy saying to the Albuquerque Journal in April 2016, the story I always heard was that Antoinette was like our mummy. She made sure all our clothes were ironed for the week, made sure we were fed and the house was clean. When our mum went out, we usually had adult supervision, but majority of times it was my sister helping the babysitter take care of us. From what I can gather, Penny, as a single mum, had to go out and work to provide, so she wasn't around as much as she probably would have liked to have been. A catch-22 situation that so many women find themselves in, expected to be the main caretaker, but also expected to provide a good life for their children, whilst trying to keep their own sort of like work life, social life balance going. So the girls were left with babysitters a lot and Antoinette took on that maternal role. She's described as responsible and caring. She had an old head on the shoulders of a nine year old and she was wise beyond her years. Her nickname for her family was Squirrel and she loved listening to Michael Jackson and Ronnie Mislap, an American country music singer. The Cayadito family lived in Gallup, New Mexico, a city with a population of just over 18,000 people as of 1980. The city, or the outskirts of the city, were often used as a filming location for Hollywood westerns throughout the 40s and 50s, to give you kind of an idea of this surrounding area. It's also home to a lot of Native American people being a border town of Navajo Nation and Arizona, although notably it's not actually on the reserve. Route 66, now the Interstate 40, passes straight through Gallup, along with Route 491. So you've got some pretty major roads here connecting this city directly to Albuquerque, which is the next large city, as well as Flagstaff in Arizona, and from there you can easily get to Phoenix. You could pretty much pass through Gallup and easily find yourself in the next big city in just a few hours. The Cayaditos lived in an apartment at 204 Arnold Street on the west side of the city, and this is mere minutes away from the junction for Interstate 40. For somebody wanting to potentially abduct a child and make a quick escape, this was a very convenient location. Antoinette's case is officially classed as a non-family abduction. 
But let's talk about the night in question, which is April 5th into 6th, 1986. The version of the story that most tend to take as truth is as follows. Penny decided to go out for the evening with some friends to a local bar and the girls were all left at home with a babysitter. It was a Saturday night, she wanted to let off some steam. But Penny didn't have a super late night. Penny would later say that she arrived home at around midnight, sending the babysitter home and the girls at that point were all asleep. I couldn't find confirmation that the babysitter backed this story up, but seeing as this is kind of the public version of the story put out there, I assume by investigators, by the police, I will assume that all of this information is correct. According to newspaper reports from the time, Penny herself wouldn't end up going to sleep until just before 3am, at which point she says the girls were all still safe and asleep. They're actually all asleep in her bed with her. Despite all of them having their own beds, sometimes they just wanted to snuggle up with their mum. At 7am that morning, running on barely any sleep, Penny got up to get the girls ready for Bible school at the local church. While she noticed that Wendy and Sadie were still in her bed with her, she saw that Anthonette wasn't, but this wasn't immediately a cause for panic. She thought that Anthonette probably just got up in the night to go to her own bed, she was nine years old. But then Penny checked Anthonette's bed and she wasn't there either. Only then did she start to think that maybe something was up with her and the other two girls checking every room in the apartment. When it became very clear that Anthonette wasn't anywhere in the home, they went to check with all the neighbours, Wendy and Sadie still in their pyjamas. They went to all the local houses to see if anyone had seen her and no one had, and then the panic fully set in. After looking everywhere she could think, Penny called the police to report Anthonette as missing at 11am. And according to the Charlie Project, despite a nine-year-old girl having been missing for at least four hours at this point, Penny was told that she would have to wait eight hours before making an official missing persons report. Eight hours for a nine-year-old girl. Of course, in the long wait until she could officially file this missing persons report, she called up Anthonette's dad to ask if he knew where their daughter was. He didn't, she definitely wasn't with him, but he came over to help with the search. It was only really on the Monday, the next day, that a real investigation and search by the police finally began. Those first few hours may have been vital in finding Anthonette alive, but we'll never know for sure because an investigation just simply didn't start. For the next three days, police and neighbours searched every inch of land that they could. They knocked on all the same doors that Penny had, but Anthonette was nowhere to be found. She had vanished and no one had seen a thing. They didn't even really have a single lead to go off of to kickstart this investigation. All they knew was at some point between 3am and 7am, Anthonette had left the house and likely not through her own choice. Penny had noted in her panic on Sunday morning that the front door and screen door to the apartment were unlocked, but she was sure she'd locked them both the night before when she came in because she always did. Seeing as there was no sign of any break-in or forced entry, it stood to reason that this is how Anthonette left the home and she'd unlikely unlocked these doors herself. But as we've already covered, she was a very responsible young girl with a very solid head on her shoulders. Both her parents agreed that she would not have opened the door for any reason other than if she thought there was somebody she knew on the other side or if there was some kind of emergency. Did somebody they knew take Anthonette? Well, that's what early investigations seem to point towards here. Investigators spoke to Wendy and Sadie, Anthonette's younger sisters, and Sadie said that in the middle of the night, her and Anthonette woke up to knocking at the front door, with voices on the other side saying it was their aunt and uncle. Sadie said that seeing as their mother didn't stir, neither her nor her sister got up at this point to investigate, instead just going back to sleep. But later, the knocking happened again, waking them up once more. This time, Anthonette did go to investigate, but Sadie just went back to sleep. Sadie was even younger than Anthonette. She was only seven years old at this time, so she had no reason to think that anything bad was going to happen here. All she knew was that there was knocking at the door, and Anthonette went up to go see what it was. She didn't realise Anthonette never came back to bed until the morning at 7am when Penny was panicking about her being missing. Now I have seen a lot of people online say that it's very suspicious that the girls would wake up to a knock at the door but Penny wouldn't. There's actually generally quite a lot of speculation online about Penny that I will discuss deeper later in the video but I do just want to add my two cents here. If there was a knock at my front door in the middle of the night I would 100% wake up. If something beeps in the middle of the night, I wake up. If my cat is downstairs screaming at nothing in the middle of the night or knocking things off the sides, I will wake up. 
I think that just comes from me being a very highly anxious person who is just constantly on the edge. My girlfriend, however, fast asleep right next to me, would never in a million years wake up to any of those things. Like, it amazes me how she can sleep through anything. It's truly a skill. Once we had the neighbor's fire alarm literally blaring for hours and she didn't even stir, which I must say is very concerning for me. I say all of this to show that some people really are just very deep sleepers and when they're asleep, they're asleep. I don't think there's anything inherently suspicious in Penny not waking up to a knock at the door, despite what some people on the internet seem to think. I would definitely wake up to that. My girlfriend would not. On April 7th, so the Monday, both the parents sat through a polygraph test and they both passed easily. It didn't seem like they were lying about anything. Of course, on my channel, we've spoken intensely about polygraph tests as a whole. I have a whole video exploring whether or not they're reliable, but it seems like a lot of the time now, law enforcement tend to use them as more of a scare tactic than anything else. Put somebody through a polygraph test and see if they snap, see if they're acting weird. The results of a polygraph test certainly can't be taken as gospel. I mean, they can't even be used in a court of law, but neither parent seems to be hiding anything in this instance. And this was enough for police to consider this an abduction by somebody outside the family and they called in the FBI to help in the search. For two days or three days, depending on the source, they searched along with volunteers from the local community. But this search was eventually called off due to complete lack of leads. They hadn't found anything and the search seemed futile. It was at this point that the police publicly announced that this was an abduction, knowing that Anthonette likely wasn't going to be anywhere in the near vicinity by this point. The Gallup McKinley Crime Stoppers offered a $500 reward for any information leading to the discovery of Anthonette, and this was later doubled to $1,000, but still nothing of any use came in. At some point, an elderly neighbour did actually come forward and said that at some point between 6.30 and 7am that morning, she'd seen a brown truck outside the Cayadito place. This was an older model with New Mexico plates, and she said she watched as a man got out of the van and approached the house. But she didn't think there was anything inherently suspicious about this because people stopped at the Cayadito house all the time. But after questioning, no one in the family knew anything of a brown truck. This potentially narrowed down Anthonette's abduction time to as late as 6.30 to 7am. This could have happened minutes before Penny woke up, but that didn't lead to any big breakthroughs in the search. All investigators were sure of was that Anthonette opened the front door, thinking this was somebody she knew on the other side. Whether it was has never been ascertained. Although to this day, Anthonette has never been found, her disappearance did actually lead to one criminal being taken off the streets. As part of the investigation, police went door to door speaking to neighbours, including to the local children. They wanted to find out if somebody had been sort of creeping around, if an adult had tried to take any children or get them to go with them, if anyone had been offered anything in exchange for chatting to an adult. Just generally looking for any creepiness from any adults in the local area. After talking to three boys aged 9 to 11 years old, investigators found out that there was indeed a man creeping around kids, and that was 62-year-old Wes Daniels. Apparently, this man liked to take the local kids on picnics where he would sexually abuse them. Daniels was quickly arrested and taken off the street, something which might not have happened so swiftly if it weren't for the investigation into Anthonette's disappearance. However, it's not thought that Daniels had anything in connection with Anthonette's case. The boy said that she was never present at any of these picnics, and it seems like his victims of choice were always young boys, never girls. No evidence was found that Daniels had anything to do with Anthonette, but he was a creep, he was a criminal, he was taken off the streets. And then after that point, her case kind of just goes cold. There were no leads for investigators to follow, there was no evidence, nothing found at the scene or nearby. That is until over a year later, in 1987, when the Gallup Police Department received a frantic phone call from a girl claiming to be Anthonette Cayadito. I'm going to insert a recording of this call here, but just a slight warning that some might find it very difficult to listen to. This is a young girl who's clearly in distress. I'm, I'm Hello? Ah, Antoinette, where are you? Antoinette? 
In a lot of cases, when an emergency phone call comes in from somebody claiming to be a missing person, you can assume it might be a hoax. However, the general consensus here is that this was absolutely not a hoax, and this genuinely may have been Anthony herself alive and well ish a year after her abduction and being held somewhere against her will. But why are so many people convinced that this was real? Well, firstly, we've all just heard the recording. It's clearly a young girl who's in trouble, a young girl who's desperately trying to make a phone call until somebody stops her and removes the phone. All reports I found say that the other voice on this call, the voice saying to her who said that she could use the phone, is that of a man. But I must say that I wouldn't rule out this voice being that of a woman. It certainly sounded a lot more feminine to me, but I'd be very intrigued to see what all of you guys think in the comments. Did you think this was a man or a woman? The fact that a woman may well be involved in Antoinette's abduction, whether during or after the fact, is something which is very much possible. We hear all of these stories of girls escaping after years in captivity, and a lot of the time a woman is complicit in that. But back to my original point, is it possible that a child could pretend to be Antoinette Kaidito as part of a hoax? Sure, it's possible. Is it possible for a child to be such a good actor? Definitely. Is it possible that they could have got an adult involved to be in the background or was this the adult's idea? Sure. But we can all probably agree that this is unlikely. Or of course there's the option that the adult overheard the hoax call and was trying to stop it, but it sounded scarier than that. This kid was genuinely scared. That scream is something you feel in your soul. And then there's the fact that in 1987, the year this phone call came in, only 50% of the USA had access to 911, the National Emergency Line. And this meant that most children across the country were still taught to memorise their local police department's 10-digit phone number. Still, for a lot of the country, if you wanted help in an emergency, you had to know the local 10-digit phone numbers to reach either the individual police station or fire stations. And kids were taught these numbers from a very young age, burned into their brains, so if they do need help, they can access it. This call didn't come into 911, it came directly into the Gallup Police Department, and only a kid from the area would have been taught it. This is a girl saying that she's in Albuquerque, but she's calling the Gallup PD. Plus, this was a time before accessible internet, before Google, so it wouldn't have been easy for somebody just to find this number. So either this was a hoax call from Gallup, but the kid is claiming to be in Albuquerque, which is unlikely, or this is genuinely Antoinette Cayadito, as the caller says, she's in trouble and she's being kept in Albuquerque. With each layer of this, the latter really does seem more likely. And then there's the final point, that Penny was played a recording of this call by law enforcement. She listened to it over and over again, and she says she knows her own daughter's voice. That was Antoinette. But she's extra sure because of how the caller, Antoinette, says her last name, Cayadito. It's not a super common surname, and Antoinette says it with the same hint of an accent as the rest of her family. Not everyone would know how to pronounce this surname perfectly, but somehow this little girl did. Therefore, Penny is sure that this was her daughter, and this means that a year after she was abducted, she was still alive. And this gave the investigation a new lease of life, but the call was only 40 seconds long in total, and therefore it wasn't long enough to be traced. And Albuquerque is a big city, you can't search every single home, every single building. Nothing in the call specified exactly where they were, Antoinette may not have even known, she may have been told they're in Albuquerque, they could be somewhere entirely different. Now at least they had hope that Antoinette may still be out there, but no one knew to start looking. It does seem like only 24 seconds of this call has been released publicly, so it does seem like investigators may have held something back for themselves, we don't have the whole recording. In 1989, this portion of the call would actually be played on public radio in the hope that it would bring in more leads, but again, there was nothing. A few years after her abduction, when Antoinette would have been 14 years old, the FBI released two computer-enhanced images in the hope that somebody might recognise her now. If she was still alive and being held against her will, chances are that this many years on, her abductors may have felt safe enough to take her out in public with them. And then, just four months later, reports of a possible sighting came in from Carson City, Nevada, 870 miles from Gallup. A waitress called the Carson City Police one evening about an incident that happened at her work that day, something that she couldn't quite shake. 
She'd been waiting on a table with a male and a female who she described as unkempt and a young girl around 14, 15 years old. This girl seemed to be very uncomfortable and she was acting very strangely. The waitress said that the girl would deliberately drop her utensils and when the waitress picked them up, the girl would grab her hand and squeeze hard. The waitress didn't think anything of this at the time. I'm sure she just came across many strange things in her work days. Maybe she thought this was just the girl's way of saying thank you. So she went about her day as usual. It was only when the group left and the waitress started to clean the table that she came across a note underneath the girl's plate and the note read, help me call the police. Then the hand squeezing made sense, but by this point the group were long gone. There wasn't much the waitress could do at this point, but she reported it to the police anyway, but nothing ever ended up coming of this. Regardless of whether this girl was Antoinette or not, she was clearly in distress, clearly in a very upsetting situation, enough to ask for help from strangers. I hope she's okay now, wherever she is. But with another burst of hope in Antoinette's investigation, one month later, investigators decided to re-interview Antoinette's sisters, Sadie and Wendy. And this is when a whole load of new information about the night in question finally came to light. Now, sources are a bit flip-floppy with this next point, but many do actually say that it was only at this point, five years later, that Sadie recalled the male and female voice saying it was their aunt and uncle. Apparently, they said, hurry, we're cold out here, open the door. It's honestly really not clear to me if Sadie shared this information in the original investigation or not, but regardless, that wasn't the most important thing to come out of these re-interviews. What was important was what Wendy said, who was only five years old at the time her sister was abducted. Wendy was now 10 years old and had clearly been pondering on something for the past few years. Now she told investigators that during the second round of knocking from the people at the door, she'd woken up as well. And when Antoinette got up to go and open the door, she followed her. Wendy said that she watched as Antoinette was grabbed by two men who took her to a brown van that was waiting outside as she kicked and fought back. This was potentially the very same brown van that the neighbour had seen between 6.30 and 7am. Before Antoinette opened the door, she'd asked who's there, to which the man on the outside answered Uncle Joe. And seeing as the girls did indeed have an Uncle Joe, she was happy to open it. Uncle Joe was Penny's brother-in-law, married to her sister. And when this new information came out, of course, Uncle Joe was interviewed and he was able to provide an alibi and a witness corroborating his alibi. There was no doubt that Joe was innocent. He definitely wasn't the man on the other side of the door. Wendy said that she didn't see the faces of either of these men, but she may have noticed if it was indeed her uncle. Why did Wendy keep this information quiet for five years? Well, she was five years old at the time. She was scared that she'd get in trouble and it was just a very confusing time for her. Everyone was upset. She didn't want to add to that. Despite how long it took her though to share this version of the story, police do believe that she's telling the truth. Although the kidnapper wasn't their real Uncle Joe, it did provide investigators with an interesting new lead in the investigation. This must have been somebody close enough to the family to know that they had an Uncle Joe. But how close? Investigators suspect that it wasn't a direct family member, but just somebody who was kind of on the outskirts. This is just me spitballing here, but in my head, this either has to be somebody who knew Penny and the girls, potentially knew them close enough that they would have mentioned an Uncle Joe in passing, and maybe they took note of that, or this is somebody who knew Uncle Joe and through him knew of his nieces. Maybe once this person heard that, they did some research, did some stalking, and found out where these nieces lived. Or the men on the other side of the door may have been completely random. Maybe they'd been simply watching the house for a while and using the name Uncle Joe was a lucky guess. Assuming Uncle Joe would have been around 30 to 40 years old, I looked at the most popular baby boy names from the 1940s and the name Joseph consistently sticks around in the top 20. A lot of young girls would have had an uncle named Uncle Joe or Uncle Joseph. Maybe this was purely a lucky guess. But there's one thing that makes me doubt the latter, and that's that somehow these people seem to know that Penny would not wake up to a knock at the door. Or maybe they didn't know that, maybe they were just taking a risk knowing that Penny may have been the one to answer, and maybe they would have had a speech planned about going to the wrong house. But it doesn't feel like that, does it? It feels like these people knew they could make a racket, knew they could knock and shout through the door, and Penny wouldn't wake up. That suggests that this was somebody incredibly close to the family. I assume that police looked into potential past lovers of Penny's, if she'd had any since the breakup from the girl's dad, which I assume she had. 
these kind of people, lovers, would definitely know that she was a deep sleeper. To me, all of this seems incredibly planned. A lot of details relied on what the abductors knew about this family. Which I suppose brings me on nicely to speak about the speculation around Penny online. And I'm going to mention this purely because if I don't, I know that people will bring it up in the comments. I don't like to wildly speculate in my videos about family members, about people close to the victims. Even speculating too much about genuine possible suspects feels like too much sometimes. Somebody can be a suspect and still be entirely innocent. But there are a lot of people online who say that Penny is lying about what happened that night. One post on Reddit said that the Gallup Police Department believed that Penny knew more about the abduction than she ever admitted. And apparently they did state this publicly in 2016, but I could not find this anywhere online apart from on Reddit. So please do take that with a very big pinch of salt. This alleged belief of theirs may have come on the back of a polygraph test that Penny apparently failed. But once again, we all know that polygraph tests are not a reliable indication of guilt or of innocence. From what I can gather, when Anthonette first disappeared, both her parents did a polygraph test administered by the local police and they passed that. But then Penny failed a second test administered by the FBI. A mother under intense stress due to a missing child though is fairly likely to fail a polygraph test. The machines don't test if you're lying or not. The machines test how your body reacts to stress. It's looking at heart rate, blood pressure, sweating and more. All indications of how stressed or anxious you are. The general consensus online does seem to be that Penny did lie about what happened that night. Perhaps she came back later than she said. Perhaps the girls were alone and not with a babysitter. Maybe she'd taken drugs. All things that she might have been scared would have put her under suspicions of the police. And maybe these allegations were true. Maybe they're not. We simply don't know. It doesn't mean that Penny was involved in Anthonette's abduction. It doesn't mean that she killed or hurt her own daughter. What it could mean is that somebody might have known the girls were alone or that Penny might have been passed out. But again, this is all alleged, it's speculation, it's internet rumours. Penny has never for a second been a suspect in her daughter's disappearance. She did everything she could for years to look for her. One thing that does give me pause though is the allegations that there wasn't a babysitter. As I mentioned earlier, I can only assume the investigators did track down and question this babysitter. Nothing I can find online suggests that this person didn't exist. So unless the police are holding back this huge chunk of information and the media has just run with it, I can't see really a world in which this babysitter didn't exist or the babysitter wasn't questioned by the police. In 1992, desperate to find her daughter, Penny turned to her Navajo heritage and along with unsolved mysteries, paid a visit to a Navajo medicine woman who conducted a crystal ritual that was used to find missing people. The medicine woman told Penny that Anthonette was still alive and she may now have a child. She's being held against her will with threats of violence. We've seen in many cases where abducted children resurface years later that once they have a child, their entire purpose becomes to protect this kid and therefore they're more likely to comply to the abductor's threats. According to this ritual, Anthony was being held somewhere in the southwest, far from any cities. And honestly, what the medicine woman said was very consistent with the police's own investigation. The Southwest is a vast place with lots of desert and empty space. If Anthonette was taken and kept alive, it stands to reason that she would have been kept in a home in the middle of nowhere. I think the general consensus here is that Anthonette was kept alive at least for a while after she disappeared. I don't think there's any question that the phone call that came in a year later was indeed her somewhere in Albuquerque. Or maybe she'd just been told she was Albuquerque and she was somewhere else entirely. The possible sighting by the waitress, I'm not as convinced that was Anthonette, but I don't think it could be ruled out. Today, Anthonette would be 46 years old. Could she have been held captive for so many years? I don't really know. If somebody did abduct her, it stands to reason that they wanted a child, and when she was no longer a child, would they have had any reason to keep her around? I think we can all agree that she wouldn't have just been released, maybe that was too risky. But there is a chance, no matter how small, that Anthonette is still out there today. Maybe she was being held captive by one or more people, either because they wanted a child or something much more nefarious. Maybe she was trafficked, maybe she was taken out of the country, but she could still be out there. Here's a photo on screen of what Anthonette might look like today. Anthonette's disappearance would hang a dark cloud over the Kaidito family forever. Three years later, her 25-year-old disabled step-aunt called Louisa Estrada would disappear from Gallup. 
However, a month later, she turned up alive and well in Juarez, Mexico and returned home. Was there any connection between their disappearances? Nobody knows. Penny died at age 46 in 1999 from cirrhosis of the liver and cardiac complications. She was the same age that Antoinette would be now. She never knew what happened to her daughter, leaving Wendy and Sadie here on earth to continue this search, but the whole family had basically fallen apart. Wendy said in a 2016 interview with the Albuquerque Journal that her and Penny eventually learned to cope by drinking and getting high, that they could never talk about Antoinette without crying. The only way they could cope was by numbing the pain. Wendy eventually fell into a whole life of drug addiction, alcoholism and gang affiliation, but she did manage to turn her life around in 2007 after going to rehab. And I'm very happy that she did eventually manage to find some peace. She was never responsible for what happened to Antoinette, she was just five years old. I could find less information about Sadie, but she did do an interview in June last year, 2022, with KOAT TV, and she said that she hasn't given up on her sister and none of them have. She said the hardest part is the fact that there's no closure, there's no rest. They hope Antoinette is still out there and they wonder what she's doing now. Maybe that's an easier way to think than the alternative and Antoinette very much could still be out there. Antoinette has been ruled out as being the Apache Junction Jane Doe found in August 1992 and the Bernalillo County Jane Doe found in May 1992, both of whom were thought to be around the age that Antoinette would have been. The FBI closed their official investigation in 2006, but from what I can gather, the case is still open with the local police, the Gallup Police Department. The last information I could find says that each time a new detective joins a team, they're given Antoinette's file to look over in the hope that they spot something new. The Caidito family weren't always happy with how the PD handled the case in the early days, with Penny saying they wouldn't update her for months at a time, and Wendy also expressing frustration in more recent years. In 2016, she told the Gallup Sun that at one point, one official even told her the department no longer had the case files or any evidence in this case, which does seem to be false. The case is still open, is classed as a non-family abduction, and if you have any information, you're urged to contact the Gallup PD or Crime Stoppers, the numbers of which I'll leave in the description box down below. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you so much for learning about Antoinette and about her case. Hopefully one day we can have more answers here. I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.